Hi everyone, hope you're enjoying these new technological lessons. Today I'm going to be talking about The Handmaid's Tale. As it says, genre is a way of grouping texts based on shared, expected shared conventions. So, let's get started. The module for The Handmaid's Tale, that we're stu when we're studying The Handmaid's Tale, is Imagined Worlds. The genre fits into its context and being able to explore the conventions of including um, outward users, the generic conventions outward users, is a way of including a very nuanced response to the context for the novel, instead of just trying to wedge in some context of production or context of reception. As with everything to do with The Handmaid's Tale, nothing is straightforward. The novel could be realized as fantasy, dystopian, speculative, or a narrow neo-slave narrative, sorry. And we're going to look at all of these today. Take plenty of notes, send them to me when you've completed the lesson. Especially at the end of the lesson, there's a Venn diagram, okay? So I want you to complete that, or some other graphic organiser of your choice, okay? But, and then send a picture of it to me. So let's get started. Is The Handmaid's Tale a fantasy? Looking at the elements on here, the handmaid still doesn't really have a magic system, so it's not it's not that that sets fantasy apart from it sets the novel apart from other genres. It does have a well developed setting. Gilead is very recognisable. Remember that palimpsest um, at the beginning of the novel, where you've got the world that used to be the gymnasium superimposed with the world that it has become the dormitory for the handmaids in the red centre. But because Gilead being recognisable makes us fill the gaps. It has a cast of complex characters. And the central conflict in the um, in the novel is the imprisonment or enslavement of Fred and her desire to be free and find her child, find her daughter. The power structure is this theocratic regime based on religion. I'd like you to pause now and make some notes on what, what makes The Handmaid's Tale a fantasy. Thank you. Welcome back. We're thinking about The Handmaid's Tale as dystopian literature. Okay. Look at the common characteristics of dystopian literature. Does The Handmaid have these? Dystopian controls, backstory, hero, conflict, society, climax, settings, themes, and at the very bottom there, which you might not be able to see, is aesthetics. Thinking about it, who's the hero? Is it Offred? Is it Nick? Is it Moira? Who knows who the hero is? And does the novel have a climax? I would agree that we are left with but. I would argue, sorry, but we're left with far too many questions at the end of the novel. It doesn't ever rise to a moment where you can't bear the tension anymore, and then it breaks. And as for aesthetics, that what is created, um, which is the philosophical study of beauty, the appreciation of beauty and artistic taste. Could we say this is true of the Italian tale at times? It's deliberately ugly, thinking about the war. However, there is also... There are also elements of beauty in there, a constant referring to flowers takes you into this realm of beauty and the realm of art for art's sake. So, pause now and make some notes. Welcome back. <clears throat> I'd like you to read this article on the Handmaid's Tale of Dystopian Fiction. How exactly is it relevant to The Handmaid's Tale? Pause the video and read it. Welcome back. I'm hoping that you found some things like this. This is what I find interesting about it. And that society itself is typically the antagonist. Society that's actively working as the protagonist aims and desires. And it is, for Offred, a collective of society as a whole, that theocratic society that causes all of her problems. That's what's made her into a handmaid. 
um, and that's what keeps her where she is, trapped and enslaved. This oppression frequently is enacted by totalitarian or authoritarian government, resulting in the loss of civil liberties and untenable living conditions caused by any number of circumstances. And Offred certainly does find the, the way she's being asked to live untenable, as do many of the other characters in the novel. Even Serena Joy, I think, hates where she is. There are laws controlling a person's sexual or reproductive freedom and living under constant surveillance, and we've got the eyes in there. Whether or not a society is perceived as a dystopia is usually determined by one's point of view. And remember, we get this novel from Offred's point of view, for whom it certainly is a dystopia. Um, but personally, if you look at it, you may not find it dystopian. I'm not sure who exactly wouldn't find that dystopian, but it is possible. Let's move on. We're going to look at speculative fiction. Um, it could be also called... Speculative fiction is interesting, isn't it? Because I think it could be called what-if fiction. Because the person takes the world, takes reality, and tweaks it a bit. Tweaks it. Changes it. And thinks, what would happen if... And Atwood has said that everything that hap has, happens in The Handmaid's Tale has happened somewhere in the world. And really what you're seeing to is... What happens, what would happen if all of these dreadful things came together in one world? How would that be? So pause, spend five minutes summarising again. Welcome back. Finally, we're going to have a look at neo-slave narratives. Now, slave narratives, first ever original genre, and I think only original genre to appear in the United States of America. They described the horrors of slavery and the escape from it. They were all about the journey to freedom. However, slavery was abolished in 1863, and in the USA, writers wrote novels about slaves escaping their enslavement, so they were written by people who hadn't been slaves. Um, by the 20th century, they were called neo-slave narratives, and they're still being written today. Corson Whitehead's Underground Railroad is a very recent, highly acclaimed neo-slave narrative. So conventions of a neo-slave narrative. It's a modern fictional work set in the slavery era by contemporary authors as substantially concerned with depicting the experience of the effects of enslavement in the New World. So enslavement in the United States of America. Conventions. We've got the loss of a name and family, the use of religion to enforce a regime, a focus on a loss of freedom, a desire to escape enslavement. I think I'd like you to make, now spend five minutes making notes on the methods Atwood uses to depict off red's enslavement and decide whether that's a key feature of the novel. Welcome back. Last thing I'd like you to do, but I have a question for you before that. If you were forced to choose which genre you would say The Handmaid's Tale fitted best. Which one would it be and why? Have a think. Decide. Write yourself a sentence about I think The Handmaid's Tale is mostly a whatever novel. And why? Thank you. And what I'd like you to do finally. Four different genres. So I'd like you to create a Venn diagram with the features of The Handmaid's Tale. So use your notes that you've made this lesson and fit them into each bubble. If you don't want to do a Venn diagram, please do a, a Venn di a graphic organiser of any style or anything you'd like, any graphic organiser, as long as you've got this idea of the four different genres that have overlapping features, um, and which one you think is most like, it's most likely to be. It'd be interesting to see if there's any feature that features in all four of them as well. So, you can stop now, and finish the lesson with your Venn diagram and then please send me a picture as I've said. Mostly the Venn diagram, I think. Um, thanks for listening and I hope to see you very, very soon. Thank you.